And it reads, now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people both high and low gave him their attention and claimed this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Simon himself uh, believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Jumping down to verse 18 through 21. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of hands by the apostles, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right with God. You may be seated in the presence of God. If you give me a few minutes, I'd like to preach a message entitled, No Magic. No Magic. Life is not magic. No, life is not magic. And I really want to understand, get a good understanding of what the word magic meant. So I did what any biblical scholar would do. I went to Google. I googled the definition of magic, and this is the first thing that popped up. It says, magic is the power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. People are using mag magic to influence life, so magic cannot be life. No, people are using magic to influence life, so magic cannot be life, because life doesn't just happen. Life just doesn't happen. You have to do something. And the truth is, even if you do nothing, that is still doing something. I know people are quick and I understand why they do it. They always say, if it's the will of God, I'll see you tomorrow. If it's the will of God, I'll see you next week. If it's the will of God, I'll see you next year. But the truth is, if you never get up, brush your teeth, hop in the shower, get in the car and drive over to see that person, or take the plane and fly out to see that person. How can will, God's will come to pass in your life? The will of God is not automatic. You have to do something. You cannot be studying for a test, praying for A, but your study habits reflect a C. No, no, you're praying to God for A, but you're studying for a C. You're asking God for more, but you act less. God does do the supernatural. He does do the supernatural. But the supernatural, what that really is, is him putting his super on top of the natural that you're already doing. You shouldn't need a miracle every day. No, you shouldn't be believing God and needing a miracle. Not every day. Jesus didn't raise Lazarus from the dead every day. You don't need a miracle every day, especially not if you become one. It is not the design of God. Yes, God can do miracles. We know that God can do miracles, but God is never going to do what you're supposed to do. God is never going to do what you're supposed to do. And I discovered that a lot of people want results, results, but they're waiting on somebody else to do the work. No, no, a lot of people want results, but they're waiting on someone else to do the work. That's like you thinking to yourself. You want to get in shape. You want to lose weight, but I'm going to just watch this person work out. And then I'm going to look at my body and hope that I'm in shape and lose weight. That does not make sense. The Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. We want so much as people, but we don't want to do what's required. In this text, Simon the sorcerer, some versions say Simon the magician, magician tries to purchase the power of God. The Bible says that he saw the apostles laying hands, giving them the Holy Spirit. And he said, I want in on that. The Bible says that he reached in his back pocket and he pulled out his wallet. Because he wanted it. But what's meant for you and what you want are two different things. See, because I, I, I want a lot of things. Some days I look at my wife. And she be looking good, boy. And I'll be like, I want another kid. But she quickly reminds me, that's not meant for you. 
No, 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 that's not, that's not meant for you. What you talking about amen? But that's not meant for you. It was never meant for Adam and Eve to eat from the tree. It wasn't meant for them to eat from the tree, but they did it anyway. Yeah, they had some influence, but they chose to. The Bible says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. See, sometimes the choice is just simply between what's meant for you and what you want. Simon, the magician, magician, he wanted power. He wanted influence. He wanted power. He wanted influence. And there's nothing wrong with wanting those things. You just have to want them for the right reason. Simon didn't want to be common. Why would he want to be common? That's like us as people. We were not born to be common. We were not born to just fit in. God wants us to be outstanding. He wants us to stand out. So I get where he's coming from. He does not want to be common. But he treats the things of God like they're common. Now, you have to understand, back in the day, Samaria had new believers. These were people who had just accepted Jesus Christ. They were newly saved. So here are the apostles in the city, and they're laying hands on them, and they're receiving the Holy Spirit. That is not common. It's not common. So he realizes that is that is uncommon, but yet still he pulls out his wallet to try to pay for it like it's common. He wants an uncommon thing, but he treats it like it's common. Why? Because he has a double mind. And the Bible says that a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Once you have a double mind, it does not mean that you can't function. You just unstable. You shaky. You play volleyball, what they say. You do a whole lot of going back and forth. Simon the magician is unstable because he doesn't have a solid foundation. But you have to understand, up to this point, his whole life has been built on, on uh, unstable conditions. That's freaking or unpredictable changes. How do I know? Because the Bible says that he was a magician and magicians do magic. Put the definition back on the screen so you can really understand the defini definition of magic. It says magic is the power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. That word apparently means as far as I know. Allegedly. It seems like. I think so. Those are all unstable words. See, magic represents unstable ways. And the Bible says there, are way, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to destruction. Magic is unstable. That's why all those things pop up. Put the definition of magic back on the screen so you can see. All those things pop up. Sorcery, witchcraft, hoodoo, voodoo, black magic. It's all over the place. Why? Because it is unstable. See, a lot of people thought magic was just a, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You, you thought that was magic. You thought it was somebody down in the lab mixing potions. You thought it was hocus pocus. A witch riding a broom. First off, that image lets you know right there that magic's unstable. How does a witch with that amount of weight ride on that small broom? Magic represents unstable ways. See, a lot of people think it's like Halloween. They're looking for a witch with a broom. But you don't know it's the lady that can be sitting next to you in the room. Magic is unstable, and any time there's instability, there's always going to be inconsistency. Simon has instability. Bible says that when he saw that the spirit was giving at the laying of hands, he said, give me also this ability. Give me this ability. He's struggling with instability, but he has enough sense to recognize that I need the ability. The issue is this, when it comes to the things of God, it's not about your ability, it's about his ability. Because his ability is what gives us the capability. That's why we sing songs like, he's able. That's why we say things like, he's able. Not you able, because you're not able. But he's able. And through Christ, he makes everyone capable. Through Christ, he gives us to have the capacity to do what? To handle things. That's why the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ. Now, when Paul wrote that, he was in prison. We quote that like it's just some happy script. He wrote it while he was in prison. Man, probably about to lose his mind. He's jailed. And he didn't do anything wrong. But he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means I can handle and not fly off the handle. Simon shows up and you can tell that his old magic ways kick back in. 
Because he tries to purchase the gift of God. He tries to purchase something that is free. That's how you know he's unstable. He tries to purchase something that is free. And understand this, Simon was a believer, but he had magic ways. He practiced magic for years. He practiced magic for years. And people always say practice makes perfect, but not if you're doing the wrong things. Practice not, does not make perfect if you're doing the wrong things. That word practice. If you look at the word practice, it means to bring into play. No, the word practice means to bring into play. And I know one person that loves to play. The enemy, the devil, he loves to play. See, the devil is always going to practice. He's always going to introduce you to some things. Because if he can introduce you, then there's a chance that he can seduce you. And if he can seduce you, then he could use you. It's always going to be an introduction. See, that word seduce means to be led astray. That's what Delilah did to Samson. She seduced him. Kept wanting to know where his strength lies. Rubbing that man locks and he would shake it off. But it was one day, I guess she got to rub him too good. She got to that spot. And he went on and told her, man, you know it's in my hair. And the Bible said that he woke up bald. Stripped of his strength. That's why in movies you always see certain things. Especially in suspense movies. You're going to see introduction. You're going to see seduction. Sometimes you're going to see abduction. But then you always see deduction. They're always going to take from you. The Bible says that the people follow Simon. They followed the magician because they was amazed. They were amazed at the miracles and wonders that he was doing. The Bible says he amazed them for a long time. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time. Some people are only around you because of what you could do for them. No, some people only follow you because of what you can do for them. They were amazed by his magic. But the Bible says that when Philip showed up, they believed in the word, the good news that he was preaching about the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. They were amazed by magic, but they believed in Philip. And the Bible says that men and women were baptized. They were amazed by magic, but they believed in Jesus. They were amazed by magic, but they believed in Jesus. You know, when I took that trip to Disney World, I was amazed. I didn't get to grow up and, and go to Disney World as a kid. We were broke. We were poor. Wasn't no Disney World. Might have been a rat that ran across the floor. That's the only Disney you get. But I went to Disney World as a grown-up, as an adult. And I was amazed by the kingdom that was there. I was just amazed and I was blown away. I was amazed by the prices. I was amazed that it seemed like every ride ended up in a gift shop. I was amazed by that mouse. I was amazed by that mouse. But I don't believe in that mouse. Because the truth is, is nothing a mouse in red drawers and yellow shoes can do for me. My faith is not in the mouse. My faith is in the Messiah. Do you believe in magic or do you believe in God? That's the question you have. To, do you believe in magic or do you believe in God? Hoodoo, voodoo, black magic, palm trees, Ouija boards. I don't have time to be operating in unstable ways. You don't have time to be operating in unstable ways, not when you should be believing the way. A solid foundation. The Bible says Simon himself believed and he was baptized. Now, this is the man that's been practicing magic for years. And all of a sudden, another man, Philip, comes, starts teaching about the kingdom of God in Jesus. And all of a sudden, he believed. He was practicing magic for years. But when he heard about Jesus, he believed. He practiced magic for years, but not once did it ever say he believed in it. Too many of us are practicing something that we don't even believe in. No, no, too many of us are practicing things that we don't even believe in. Why are you still practicing with that girl? No, why are you practicing with that woman? Why are you practicing with that man? You don't even believe that the relationship is going to work. You don't even believe that you're going to get married. Why are you still practicing with them? 
Why are you still practicing with them? Practicing is something that you don't even believe in. It amazes me when people come to me and they want me to believe in something they're doing when they don't even believe in what they do. They want me to believe in what they're doing and they don't even believe in what they're doing. And it always shows because the minute things don't go the way they think it should. The minute things don't go according to the plan, they're no longer doing it. Simon becomes a believer, but he still has magic ways. Simon is a believer, but he still has magic ways. We as the church have to understand this. It's people that come down to the altar. But when they leave, they still have magic ways. People who have been baptized came out the water, supposed to be a new creation, but they still have magic ways ways. They've already accepted Christ, but they're thinking about suicide. Why? Because of magic ways. People still struggle with magic ways. And Simon has magic ways. And the thing about it is, if you are not careful, you will start to mistake magic for God. You will start to mistake magic for God. You can look in the text. The Bible says that the people were following Simon the magician and saying, this is a great power of God. This is a great power of God. Mistaking magic for God. It's no different. That's in the Bible, but you can bring it up to speed to this age. People still mistake magic for God. People still allow their zodiac signs to dictate their behavior and their personality. No, no, they still, they, 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 they really believe that. They really, they really believe that zodiac signs have a lot of influence. We're talking about believers here. I'm talking about believers. I'm a cancer believer. No, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Leo believer. I'm a Sagittarius believer. I'm a Capricorn believer. And the whole time that thing is unstable, that's what it means to be unequally yoked. God says, come out from amongst them. And the thing I've discovered is zodiac signs are all about you. You ain't noticed that yet. Zodiac signs are literally all about you. And when God created you, it was never about you. It was to encourage and build up others. And as you build them up, he was going to build you in the process. God is supposed to be the source of your strength. Who is your foundation? Who is your source? But I get it. It's our human nature because we, we selfish people. No, people are selfish by human nature. Simon was making a name for himself. Simon was out there making moves. The people knew his name. They're already talking about he's a great power of God. He was making a name for himself. But the question is, are you trying to make a name for yourself? Or are you trying to make God known? Are you trying to make a name for yourself? Or are you trying to make God known? That's why you can't get caught up in the magic tricks. You have to be able to recognize the characteristics. Just because people follow you don't mean they're for you. No, no, no. Just because people follow you don't mean they're for you. You know how many people got a bunch of followers on social media? Half them people are not for them. If you believe that, just go click those comments and see. Person ripping them apart, but when you go to their page, they're following the person. Just because people follow you don't mean they're for you. The Bible tells a story about Paul and Silas. How they were being followed by a slave girl. The Bible says that she had a spirit of divination, which is a fortune telling spirit. The Bible says that she followed them for days yelling out, these men are trying to tell you the way to be saved. That sounds good to me. That's what they're doing, right? Says they were yelling that out. She was yelling out, following these men through the town, yelling it out for days. Finally, they say Peter got, Paul got frustrated. The Bible says that he turned around and he rebuked the evil spirit and the spirit came up out of her. But then the people in the town who was profiting off the girl, they said, wait, hold on, hold on, you, you messing up the money. We don't care about nothing about souls getting saved. We're choosing the money. You messing up the money. And the Bible says that they bound them up and sent them to jail. Just because people follow you don't mean they're for you. And confrontation is not a bad thing. No, no, in life you're going to have to confront some things. No, in life, you're going to have to confront some things. But the thing is, a lot of people focus on confronting people instead of principalities. 
Why is it we so quick to run up on people, but we so slow to tear down principalities? It's never been about the person. It's always about the principality. Those are the thoughts, the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Those are the things that you're supposed to tear down. It's the thoughts. That's why Peter tells Simon, you thought you could buy the gift of God. You thought you could buy the gift of God. We're so quick to run up on people, but slow to tear down principalities. Quick to say, man, they're not really doing a bad thing. I mean, I mean, it's kind of good, but is it a God thing? See, I discovered that we as believers, we're quick to sell it for a good thing, but is it a God thing? They be like, hold on, hold on, what you mean? But God is good, but everything that's good ain't God. Everything that's good is not God. I was reading a post. I came across a post and it said, man, you need to be making moves in silence. Make your moves in silence. Don't let nobody know what you're doing. Make your moves in silence. And I'm like, for what? If we're made in the image and likeness of God, Jesus lived out loud. No, no, Jesus' very presence, his very presence made announcements. Your actions should make announcements. But I'm reading this post and saying, no, nah, man, you got to move in silence. And it got about a million likes on it. People agree, yeah, yeah, make your moves in silence, make your moves in silence. But, but these move in silence. No, no, the enemy moves in silence. God told Cain, if you're not careful, the enemy is crouching at your door. Do you know what crouching is? That's not a loud action. That's moving in silence. The Bible said that he used a snake. That's the most shrewd. That's the most slick animal. It's moving in silence. The devil may be loud, but he always moves in silence. That's why you have to be able to recognize the enemy. And truth be told, a lot of people cannot recognize the devil. They cannot recognize magic. And I understand. I get it. It is tough. It is not an easy thing to do. When you read the Bible and it says where the angels went and presented themselves to God, the Bible says that Satan showed up with them. I love that story because I'm such a visual. I always just visualize it. Angels, hundreds of them marching to present themselves to God. Satan came right on in with them. Standing, he, he on the front row. He in front of the line. And I know the angels didn't recognize him because otherwise, why didn't they check him? So that lets me know the enemy looks just like us and he looked just like everybody else. But God himself was able to recognize him. He said, devil, what you doing? No, no, what you doing here? And then he said, man, look here, I've been going to and fro. That means I've been going back and forth. He unstable, so I'm, I'm going back and forth. Seeking whom I can devour. That means he can't just devour anyone, but he says, I'm seeking someone to devour. You have to understand the characteristics of magic. You got to be able to recognize magic. When I was growing up, my favorite basketball team was the Orlando Magic. I love the Orlando Magic because I love Tracy McGrady. And I remember being in middle school, I remember in high school about to fight people over who was better, Tracy McGrady or Kobe Bryant. I'm talking about people, mom, I'm talking about their daddy. Because I felt like Tracy McGrady was the best basketball player. We get into fights. So, and then years later, I found out that they were cool. Now, I'm about to fight over somebody I do not know every day for years and come to find out they cool the whole time. We as believers, we got to get past fighting over things just because it's not our style, just because it's not our preference. No, no, no. We as churches got to get over fighting each other just because it's our, not our style, just because our, it's not our preference. How you know God ain't cool with that? No, no, how do you know God is not cool with it? Because what I think is cool is lame to somebody else. But how do you not know that God is not cool with that? And it hit me. I never fought over the team. It was never the Lakers versus the Magic. It was always Tracy McGrady or Kobe Bryant. It was always over the individuals. We're fighting each other and we're missing the fact that we're on the same team. Fighting each other and missing the fact that we're on the same team. And the enemy is practicing magic on us. He's introducing instability. He's sowing division. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. Therefore, it becomes unstable. You have to be able to recognize magic. Apostle Paul didn't know what was going on, but he kind of recognized magic. He said, wait, there's some, it's some type of war going on in me. He says, it's, it's, it's something in me. He says, some type of war that's waging, raging in me. He says, it's against my mind. It's making me a prisoner of the law of sin. It's at work within me. 
Can I tell you what was going on? I always talk about it. It was the fiery darts. The Bible speaks of the enemy using a tactic called fiery darts. And to me, it's his favorite tactic. And what fiery darts are, they're just thoughts. That's all it is. He's bringing magic into play. He's bringing unstable thoughts into play. He's just shooting thought after thought after thought. Oh, you blocked that one. Okay, you shook that one after thought. But he just keeps shooting thought, hoping one will stick and consume you. But the Bible says you have to take those thoughts captive. You can't let those thoughts captivate you because an idle mind is the devil's playground. An idle mind is the devil's playground. I was sitting there and my kids, for some reason, they love to play hide and seek and just be tearing up the house. Like, just, they quick to play some hide and seek. Go read a book. Go do something else. But they love to play hide and seek and be tearing up the house. But as I was sitting there watching them play hide and seek, I realized that the mind is the best hiding spot. A lot of people hide things in their mind. And the person will never be able to see it. You hide thoughts about how you feel about other people. You in a new relationship, you in a new marriage, but you're thinking about your ex, but can't nobody see it because it's in your mind. The mind is the best hiding spot. What was going on in Simon's mind? What possessed him to pull out his wallet? People laying hands at you, like, man, I'm, he done cut through the line, man. How much, how much y'all want for this? What was going through his mind? What possessed him? On verse 22 of Acts, I like to say Peter cussed him out real good. <laughs> Peter, Peter, he didn't curse, he cussed him out real good. And he tells them that you need to repent and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. A thought in your heart. Wait a minute, I thought thoughts were in your mind. How did a thought get into his heart? Because this is the thing. If you let a thought, especially an unstable one, sit in your mind for too long, it's going to work its way down. That means it's taking root. And it takes root in your heart. That's why you have to deal with the root of issues. I always tell people, when you don't deal with the root of issues, all you're doing is sweeping dirt up under a rug. Yeah. People may not see it, but the dirt is still there. But if you sweep enough dirt under that rug, sooner or later that rug is going to lift. It's going to lift. And not only do you trip, you start to affect other people that's around you. The thought was in his heart. That's why we got to deal with the root of issues. Peter tells him, he says, you're full of bitterness. Now, that word bitterness means discontent. And any time you're discontent, you're disconnected. He's a believer, but he's disconnected from the source. Discontent will always leave you disconnected. But he tells him, repent. Repent means to turn away and walk away from. See, what repentance really is, is a change of heart in your heart and mind that brings you closer to God. It includes turning away from sin and turning to God for forgiveness. You have to turn away and turn to. You're facing the way, but you have to turn away and turn to. A lot of people miss the turn to. A lot of people miss the turn to because they, 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 they have enough strength. They have enough in them. They are strong enough to turn away. But the turn to, if you just stay there, if you just stay there, the enemy is just going to tap you on your shoulder and tell you to turn right back around. That's how people stay in toxic relationships. That's how people stay in abusive relationships because they turn away, but they don't walk away. You just turn away and the enemy right behind you. Man, come on, give me a hug. Stop playing. You have to turn away and turn to. Turn to what? Turn to God. You have to turn to God. Turn away and turn to God. Some people have turned away, but they don't see a way. They, 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 they made a decision to turn away, but they don't see a way. But that's when you have to do what the Bible instructs us, which is to walk by faith and not by sight. Because life is not magic. You have to be able to recognize magic. You have to be able to confront magic and then you have to continuously choose to believe God over magic. 
continuously believe. That means it's a process to continue to believe God instead of magic. The Bible says that when the people heard Jesus, they believed. You only have one job, and that's to believe. Well, God, I don't know how it's going to work out. Believe. But you don't understand where I come from? Believe. I lack the education? Believe. But look at my past? Believe. You know I'm that? Believe. You have one job, and it's to believe. Because God is not into magic. He's into you. 